Welcome back to another episode of the Vision Hunters podcast. I'm your host, Cody Story, and this is episode number 15, part two of two, staying connected to the natural world during the digital revolution with Daniel Vitalis. Real quick, before we get into today's show, new episodes of the Vision Hunters podcast are released every Wednesday on Spotify and Apple podcast. Or if you want to watch the show, you can head on over to my Cody Story YouTube channel. The spelling there is C-O-D-Y-S-T-O-R-E-Y. Daniel Vitalis is the host of Wild Fed. For 10 years, he lectured around North America and abroad, offering workshops that helped others lead healthier, more nature-integrated lives. A successful entrepreneur, he founded the nutrition company SirThrival.com in 2008. Most recently, he hosted the popular podcast Rewild Yourself. He's a registered main guide writer, public speaker, interviewer, and lifestyle pioneer who's especially interested in helping people reconnect with wildness both inside and outside of themselves. After learning to hunt, fish, and forage as an adult, Daniel created Wild Fed to inspire others to start a wild food journey of their own. Headquartered in the lakes region of Maine, he lives with his beautiful wife, Avani, in their plot hound, Ellie. Before we dive in, as I just mentioned, this is part two of two. So if you missed part one last week, I recommend that you go back and listen to part one first. This will help give you some more context for the interesting subjects we discussed in part one, like transhumanism, how our species is being dumbed down, and the impacts of living in an artificial world. Now, for today's show, some of the things that we discussed are the long-standing propaganda program against one of our most fundamental birthrights as hunter-gatherers, the left and right wings of environmentalism, the impact of being disconnected from our natural landscape, why they are attempting to erase our biological norms, the importance of living and functioning within a tribe and the impacts of living alone, some of the reasoning behind experiencing different rites of passage, the loss of reverence for our elders, the acquisition of wisdom through medicine journeys, the effects of dismantling the nuclear family, the importance of weapons when dealing with two-legged predators, and the complex topic of living during a time where our very freedoms our country fought for are being threatened. Now it's time to either sit back and enjoy part two of episode 15 with Daniel Vitalis, or go and have a very thought-provoking walk in the woods as you listen to this episode of the Vision Hunters podcast. I think that's going to change in the coming decades as more and more stakeholders will be involved. Hikers and campers and canoers are going to start to have to pay in too. Mm -hmm. But currently, and for the last 80 years or whatever it's been, it's been hunters have been paying for that. So Mm -hmm. um, if anyone thinks that we hunt because we want to just destroy all the wildlife, it's like the people I know that hunt, hunt because they love the outdoors. They Mm -hmm. love wild creatures. They love the animals they eat. And that's part of why they want to make their bodies out of them. So Mm -hmm. I just think there's been a, there's been a long-term propaganda program since the days of Bambi to make hunters look stupid, to make our motives look wicked, Mm -hmm. to uh, give the appearance that we are destroying everything around us when in fact we've been pumping dollars into conservation and it is time for environmentalists to get on board and start to pay up too, because they mm-hmm. have not made <laughs> their portion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so people don't know that there's an interesting thing. It's kind of like there's a right wing and a left wing in caring about the earth, just like mm. there is in politics. Mm. And the sort of more right wing of it has been conservationism. Mm. And the left wing of it is called environmentalism. <laughs> yeah. And those, somebody might think those are interchangeable words, but they're not. So when somebody says conservation, they typically are a hunter, angler, they have extractive use. Maybe they're mm-hmm. a logger or something like that. They mm-hmm. believe that these resources can be used in perpetuity as long as we don't take so much as to ever wipe out the bank account. 
-hmm. The environmentalist tends to take a different approach, which is humans can walk through it, but not touch it. It's hands off. You're only allowed to look at it. Mm. That, that is, I'm very concerned about where that leads. Um, I'm sorry, I know I'm going on here, but I'll just the last piece on this is that the reason is because if you take a hands-off approach, you aren't a stakeholder. Yep. You don't know what's even there anymore or why it's important. Um, and what it leads to is like, if you have no connection to a place, it leads to not having a desire to save a place. So something that, you know, you remember when um, uh, one that stands out in my mind, um, it'll happen with big dam projects. It'll ha it happened with Standing Rock. It happens with pipelines. Mm -hmm. Remember when people from all over the country were going to stand with Standing Rock? Remember that mm -hmm. about the yeah, water project there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so beautiful and noble intention. Yeah. But I guarantee you that every single one of those people has a local issue that they didn't get involved in. They all got focused on an, a thing that was happening in a place where they didn't live because they're not involved in the place where they live. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So there's water problems everywhere. I, I, that's a big one. And I, of course, I'm so glad that people went to do the stand, standing rock thing, yeah. of course. But what I'm saying is like, why weren't they standing for the water where they live? Why aren't mm -hmm. they standing for the wildlife where they live? Why is it so easy to get mad about Cecil the lion in Africa, but not think about the wildlife in your own backyard? And if that sounds crazy to people, you know, there's a really interesting study looking at questions asked to school children about wildlife. And they would ask, they, they were asking kids, tell me about wild animals. And kids are like zebras, lions, elephants. And it's like, do those live where you live? No. Do you even wow. know any wild animals where you live? And what the study found is when they did know animals that lived where they lived, they typically had a very negative perception of them as dirty, dangerous, and disease-ridden. Mm. So, oh, raccoons, well, they're dangerous, they're gross, they're in garbage. Yeah. Right? Yep. Those kind of perceptions, those are yep. dirty, bad animals. The good animals are the ones in Africa. Yep. This is a weird thing. We need to be local in our approach. The thing about hunters is they know the wildlife where they live. They know about the patterns of life of those animals. They know the plants that those animals interact with. They know the sign of those animals. So they start to be invested in the place. Mm -hmm. I don't see how we ever get out of this problem by focusing on other places and not caring about where we live. Mm -hmm. So there was this funny thing that the Catholic church was into in, in medieval Europe where you could sin. And if you had enough money, you could buy credits. So your sins <laughs> oh were forgiven. God, They're called indulgences, right? So oh, Lord. if you were poor, you couldn't do this. But if you were more elite, you could be like, well, I got a prostitute, but I bought an indulgence. So it's oh offset. My God. Yeah. Now we have the same program going. It's called carbon offset credits. I can come in and damage this wetland if I fund a wetland somewhere else. Mm. So what ends up happening is uh, the, the corporate entity that wants to damage the incredibly important place where you live, if nobody in that place is using that landscape, if nobody's there shooting deer, harvesting mushrooms, harvesting plants, or just generally making medicine off that landscape, using wood from there, whatever it is, if somebody's not using that landscape, then it's really easy to do a sleight of hand where they go, well, we're going to damage this, but we're going to fix this beautiful place. And then we all get distracted by the bright lights and go, oh, that beautiful place, because we're not invested in home. Mm. So while it's noble to fly out in a plane and use fossil fuels to go like get invested, you know, saving some other place like, hey, cool, man. But how about you stay home and you deal with what's there? Well, why would you if you didn't know what's there? How can you know what's there if you're not involved in the landscape? How can you be involved in the landscape if you don't eat from it? Mm -hmm. So and then we're decisions, going about this wrong. decisions are being made from people who aren't living in that landscape. Right. right. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and that's the problems with a lot of our um, environmental policy is the people that are making it don't know anything about these. I mean, mm -hmm. look at our Congress. Yeah. You know, I think in the last four <laughs> or five years, people have become very aware of what our Congress and our Senate are, and our, the House and the Senate of our Congress. And you look at these people, it's like, oh, wait a second. These are the legislators. But first of all, they're very busy. Mm -hmm. Second, they're not even getting to read these bills. Yeah. Third, they are very invested in their careers, making money, private yeah. interests, climbing the social ladder, their next campaign, mm -hmm. who their campaign they're going to support. Do they have a run for a higher office? They're not very few of them are very <laughs> invested in what's happening on the landscape. You know what yeah. I mean? We, yeah. so, so the decisions are being made by people who are too remote 
from the actual thing. So, um, yeah, overall, like, uh, if we, I feel if people aren't invested in some way and that again, so if it's like, I don't get it in order to teach people about the natural world, you want them to go in there and kill things. It's like, it's mm -hmm. way bigger than that. I want you to make your body out of those things so that you realize how important those things are. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a different thing than put a head on the wall. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No big, big difference out of respect for your time. I, I'm, I just want to make sure if we were to go any further, did you need to jump out now or do you have a couple more minutes? A to... few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So I love the way this is heading. And what's funny is like the direction that I was thinking with the questions is like over here and we've gone over here, but this yeah. is actually the stuff I was trying to think about. How are we going to get into that? You know, yeah, because yeah. they are big topics and Huge, yeah. I'll be honest, like I <clears throat> haven't invested a ton of time in contemplating these topics. However, I've been aware of them. So it's kind of even like it's me trying to get back into the wilderness, having that experience of like, oh, shit, how does this work? And all of that. I kind of feel like that with even mentally navigating this terrain that we're discussing here. Like, how do I even get into that conversation or that discussion? And sometimes, depending on who you talk to, it can be very loaded or, you know, a little hostile, hostile, especially in like the nutrition world and diets and all of that stuff. The diet wars. Yeah, dude, it's just insane. I mean, that's partially why I just didn't dive too deep when I was in the fitness industry as far as food, because every time I did, it was just like an all out war. And I'm just like, dude, I, I don't come from that place. I'm not into drama. I'm not into that. You guys have fun fighting about it. I'm just going to eat whatever I want in terms of what I feel is optimal for me as a human being. Mm -hmm. So um, because we don't have a ton of time left, there are some things that I don't really know how to get into exactly. But when I listen to your podcast, I've heard these subjects be talked about, touched on, and other people have shared stories um, and knowledge behind them. And it's kind of like, I'll put this out here, <clears throat> whatever way you want to go with this is, we've touched on the little bit of evolution. I'd love to on another time go even deeper there. Human domestication. I'd love to go even deeper there with you. Um, I also do want to eventually capture your journey as an entrepreneur in the digital yeah. world while living off of, right. you know, the landscape at the same time. But I just, I can't get these things out of my head. And I always get to face them when I listen to you talk. Now, one is tribe, right? Community in terms of where we come from. You mentioned it as far as there was usually communities of like 30, 40, 50, you know, individuals living together and, and supporting one another. Also, rite of passage, and then elders, which I think maybe <clears throat> sometimes people call yeah. mentors these days. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next piece is also things such as you talked about medicine. So like plant medicine, or even like toad venom, 5-MeO DMT, like I had an experience with that for my first time this year in the middle of the dark night of the soul. Welcome to and being a new person. <laughs> dude, I just was like, I wish I would have done that at 13. Like I've heard some other cultures are introduced mm -hmm. to that. And the only thing I could think of is, oh my God, like that's the ultimate to me, the ultimate rite of passage. So I don't know how we could weave this in limited amount of time here, but yeah. community and tribes, rite of passage, elders, and then, you know, plant medicine, you know, being a tool or, you know, I know a toad is not a plant. Um, so some sort of medicinal use, even coming from animals or from toads or whatever, like, I just don't know where to start with yeah, those things, but I, I'm so think, inspired to want to learn that. more about it. I think I can feel some of that. At okay. Least, okay. At least, you know, we can save it. You know, best. we can go deeper another time. Well, into I would love them. to, I wish I had more time to, to, because there's a lot to each of these, but yeah. what we're talking about are human biological norms. Okay. Now, this is something that go. the world of transhumanism hates ideas like this. Biological norms. So this frustrates them endlessly because they want to erase all biological norms because they want a world where humans are absolutely free from any of the constraints of their biology. That's why they want to get out of bodies and get into machines. That's why they want to get out of, get off of earth and get to Mars where there's mm -hmm. no more constraints of these things. Right. So, mm -hmm. so some of what I'm talking about is challenging to people who, if that's kind of their religious bend is transhumanism. But when I say biological norms, what I mean is these are the things that have been normal present biology for in sociology for human beings for our entire existence. So, um, you know, if you get a bunch of crows together, it's called a murder of crows, or you get a bunch of lions together, it's called a pride of lions, right? Or you get a 
bunch of geese together, it's like a flock of geese. Mm-hmm. Well, what is it when you get a bunch of humans together? It's called a tribe of humans, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just like it's really unhealthy to take a uh, man, I don't know if you ever saw that documentary. I think it was Blackfish, where they they want to take an did. orca from the wild it to, mm-hmm. for Sea World, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. And you watch the Trippy. females whales just crying, trying to locate when they took that one individual male out, that young male. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're a pod, they're a yeah. family, they're a tribe of whales, right? Mm-hmm. Taking that young whale um, and putting him in isolation in a tank, he mm-hmm. ended up killing a bunch of people, quite a few mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was a Canadian company that had him first, and then they, they gave him to SeaWorld. He killed some people over there. Mm-hmm. Pretty epic story, really. But what happens when you take an animal out of its biological norms, right, is it, it it's mentally unwell. Wow. So biological norms. One is the kind of community. Now, what you hear almost ad nauseum, like I'm, I'm, all, I tire of it. Is this like we're building community, or like welcome to the, you know how it is when you got a podcast, like welcome to my podcast community. Yep. It's like that's not a community. Mm-hmm. I know what we mean, and I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. But it's not really a community. Um, we've grossly oversimplified the term. Or have you noticed that whenever, uh, especially you must have heard of in LA constantly, all these people who are like, they make a little money in tech or something, they think they're going to go build an intentional community. Yep. They yep. always fall apart, dude. They never last. The ones that last the longest usually are cults, not communities, mm-hmm. because they have some hierarchical leadership that at least kind of holds it together. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting is tribes of people didn't have hierarchy. They were egalitarian. The people were considered individual sovereigns. They were there because they wanted to be. There's no real boss Mm -hmm. in a tribe. That's a pretty fascinating thing about hunter-gatherers. Okay, so these communities don't last. And one of the reasons is these. there's no shared fate. There's no uh, skin in the game. And there's especially no blood relationship. They're not kin. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the communities that we were talking about, intact communities prior to agriculture, Mm -hmm. prior to city-states, you participated because you die on your own. You know, you see those shows like alone, we talked about how hard <laughs> that is to survive yeah. on your own. Yeah. And you actually, if you notice what, what breaks people down is their brains, their yeah. minds, yeah, they, they lose it. You need to be with people. Yeah. Okay. So what's hard for us now is that when we have a nuclear family, you know, you, your wife, if you have kids, a dog, cat, whatever it is, you have shared fate that's held together pretty strong. That's hard to break down. You watch a society's trying to break it down now and they're doing a good job, but it's hard. It used to be that families were very connected at a larger level to grandma, grandpa, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, but that's all getting broken down too, right? We're, we're being broken down to the individual level. That's why every new technology is called I something. Mm. iPod, iPhone, I this, I that. Why? I, 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 the ego, wow. the individual. Wow. The idea that the individual, the idea that you're sitting in a room, you're watching one thing, the person next to you is watching another thing, and you're not communicating with each other, you're communicating with other people. <laughs> this I world, right? The mm. iPod. To me, when I hear iPod, that sounds like I'm in an isolated pod by myself. Mm-hmm. And yep. metaphorically, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. But when you look at how these tribes functioned, it was survival together. And there was a tremendous focus on the children because of the idea that we need to perpetuate this tribe and you're going to need someone to take care of you later. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one component. They're very hard. It's very hard to create a functional community with people who aren't people who aren't related and people who can just bail out at the second that they have to face their psychological shadows. Mm-hmm. And one of the hardest parts is when every, one of the things I've noticed about communities that do work, I said, they're kind of culty. One of the things they often do is make you give up all your money to the cult. Now, I don't like that, but why I see that helps is because if you have your own, like, let's say I move into a community with you, right? And you're making some money from your podcast and I'm making money mm-hmm. from my podcast. And all of a sudden I have to deal with a psychological shadow, or maybe I have to deal with your psychological shadow. Mm-hmm. I got my own money. It comes from my own source. I can just boot out of there, like nothing to hold me there. Mm-hmm. So it's very hard to hold egomaniacs and narcissists together. And that's what we're all becoming. Mm-hmm. We've all been taught the art <laughs> of narcissism. Yeah. So staying together is really, really difficult for us to do. Yeah. Um, 
rites of passage come out of. What is a rite of passage? The point, we could get confused because today a lot of our rites of passage are rites of passage for the individual ego, not for you showing your commitment and strength to the tribe. Mm. Mm. So the old rites of passage were your way of showing the tribe that you can handle shit. Mm, yeah. Right? It wasn't yeah. to prove to yourself that you're cool. Yeah. In fact, proving that you're cool is really shameful in, in the tribal environment. Mm. It's showing commitment to the group, which we don't do as wow. much of. Where we see the remnants of that are in gang culture, mm -hmm. where people, right? The rites of passage mm -hmm. that happen in gang culture are to show what you're willing to do for the gang. Yeah. These are distorted reflections of our natural way. So I'm not wow. saying gang culture is good. I don't think it's good, but yeah. you see tribalism in the gang culture and you're seeing it right now. Like, let's say you take like a divisive thing, like the mask wearing mm -hmm. that all, what, you know, all of the, um, or not mask wearing, both are ways of showing your loyalty to the tribe that are distortions. Mm -hmm. They're, it's unhealthy what we're doing, but it comes from us showing our gang colors, showing our mm -hmm. tribal affiliations, mm -hmm. right? That's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's, that's natural to us. It's a biological norm, and we're doing it because we don't have the biological norm in place. Mm -hmm. The elders is another one because, you know, my friend Arthur and I joke that we have elders, not elders. Or he said, hey, the um, books today are our elders, unfortunately. Wow. That's all we have. And wow. I like to point out that when myth telling around the fire, you know, this is the, the reason for human language is like, we're around the fire, we're communicating and we share stories. Now, when you look at what those stories are often about, they are based on legends that come from the stars. So human beings find patterns in the stars and the annual migration of stars, the apparent, it's also going around the sun, but mm -hmm. the apparent migration of stars through the sky, through the seasons, we would tell stories about those and the stars became the gods and goddesses of our tales. Mm -hmm. Or they became the ancestors that we told stories about. Mm -hmm. What we've done now is blotted out the sky with bright light so we can't see the stars. And mm -hmm. we've replaced it with the Hollywood stars. Mm -hmm. wow. So now we still have st the stars that still are the source of our stories. Yeah. Now it's Brad Pitt instead of Orion. Yeah. He's become a star. Well, he's a fallible human, unlike in the ancient light coming from millions of years ago from these stars and forming us, right? Yeah. We've replaced all our biological norms with fake cheap versions, yeah. right? So now we don't have elders and we're actually at a point where we just stick them away somewhere to die. Yeah. And we don't see their wisdom anymore. And young people think, oh, you don't know anything. I mean, look at these, look at the hubris that you had and I had Dude. as kids. It's Insane. really frustrating to see it in young people today who think because these old people didn't have social media growing up that they just don't have anything useful to offer. Yep. It's shameful. Mm. It's actually truly shameful. And um, re there was reverence for elders based on what those elders had done and lived. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But our elders have been so domesticated and, and they've been living so much like uh, we just, we don't look at them as heroes anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't look at them as wise men and wise women anymore. Mm -hmm. And sometimes justifiably, because some, a lot of them, you look at the boomer generation now, they lived a very shallow existence in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that the young generation today will look at you and I and think we lived shallow lives unless we do something to warrant it. Now, I know some elders that I think are badass, but I know some that are mostly just old people. Mm -hmm. So it's partially on us to be cool old people. But is, another part of it is that we have, we lost the biological norm. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, one thing that frustrates me, you'll hear from um, biologists sometimes is after you reproduce, nature doesn't need you anymore. It's like, wh what? That's no, crazy. after you reproduce, your job is to bring up the young. You have a very mm -hmm. real and important need. Yep. Elders, we need them to bring and one of the things that's cool is you'll see that generationally what tends to happen is that young people will gravitate they'll rebel against their parents generation and they'll gravitate towards their grandparents generation yeah. so you'll see the grandparent who's super cool and does all the things with the kid that they want to do and mom and dad are too busy and don't care or trying to tell you no don't do that and grandma or grandpa sneaks you the candy or takes mm -hmm. you to that cool place yep we need that but we don't have it and without it there's no wisdom there's Lots of intelligence around, but there's no wisdom. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah. without wisdom, we have no guiding light and we're following around our intelligence into stupidity, mm. unfortunately, because there's nobody to say, hey, I've been around long enough to see patterns and here's mm -hmm. how they work. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that made people wise in the past was those medicine journeys. Mm -hmm. And again, the elders would have had more of them under their belt. And once you do, let's say you have that experience, the 5-MEO experience with the Bufo toad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that experience is powerful, right? And you realize yeah. real quick, wait, other people have had this experience a bunch of times. Yeah. What have they learned? Oh, yeah, wait, dude. right. Like what have they learned? So, yeah. so imagine you've got an elder that you're a, you're a young hunter and they've hunted for 40 years. Well, what were, imagine how much respect you'd have versus mm -hmm. kids today, or let's say you're a, a, a young woman about to have your first baby. And you're looking at women who are grandmothers, like how much wisdom do they have? Or you're a young uh, practitioner of the medicine arts, like what we'd call a shaman. And mm -hmm. you're looking at the old man or old woman who's done this you know, you so much respect, but all mm -hmm. that's kind of crumbled apart. I think that there's been a concerted effort to undermine all of these biological norms and reduce us from the tribe down to the, and there's bigger things than tribes, obviously there's mm -hmm. language groups and these big people groups and stuff, but from the clan down to the small tribe group down to, you know, colonization destroyed that and it wanted to go down to the nuclear well, the extended family to the nuclear family. It used to be, and I'll notice this with older people where I live, they like to, they want to like know all their neighbors, but our generation and the younger generation is like, oh, I don't want to know you. I don't want to know you. I don't want to mm -hmm. stay yeah. out of my space. I want privacy, right? So yeah. we broke down even the neighborhood down to the nuclear family. And now the oh. nuclear family is coming unglued and it's getting to where kids think their parents are just stupid and holding them back. Mm. Right. But should pay for everything and let them live at home at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it won't be hard when you have divided and conquered everybody. It won't be hard to subjugate the entire population into a sort of technological prison state when there is no cohesion between individuals mm -hmm. any longer. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out that when we think dystopia, a lot of people think 1984. 1984, George Orwell looks a lot like North Korea style governance. Mm -hmm. But Huxley's book, A Brave New World, is a, probably a more important read for our culture because that's a servitude where people fall in love with it and they think they're living in paradise. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the Huxley world, it's a prison but it's a prison where everybody has this abundance and everything's fun and there's parties and there's music and there's drugs and there's fashion and there's all this stuff. And, and that's what LA is. Mm -hmm. That's how I see, you know, that's how I see um, <laughs> our modern culture is it's like, well, I've got my own music. I've got my own movies. I've got the cool sneakers. I've got all these, I've got 5,000 friends. It's like, dude, you don't have a single friend, mm -hmm. right? They're all fake. It's all fake. The mm -hmm. whole social media thing's fake. All this attention's fake. All this social credit's fake. Mm -hmm. people have come to, they're drugged into mm -hmm. loving their servitude. So that can only happen when you fractured out the entire biological normal structure that keeps humans mentally and psychologically healthy. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that anymore. And we've kind of gone crazy. Mm -hmm. And that has led to this really dire crossroads we're standing at where you've got people thinking that the logical next thing is we just leave earth and go to Mars. Like, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm staying. Mm -hmm. See mm -hmm. I'm staying. It's insane, dude. The, the repercussions of mm -hmm. these things, this, this breakdown over time is wild. And it's so crazy as you're talking about those things. I'm like, yep, I've experienced that. Yep. I've experienced that. As I try to like track the little knowledge of my lineage, grandparents, father, mother to where I am. And then thinking about passing it on and, what other thing came up while you were talking about that is living in the city. Like it's interesting. I'm equipping myself or working towards equipping myself with more guns to go and hunt and do things. But before this, I equipped myself with guns to protect, protect myself from other humans in the city. Like I mm -hmm. literally had some dude while I was reading a book in the middle of the day in my underwear, try to break in my window. So what was my gun for? Yeah. Well, it was to protect my, property or my loved ones right yeah. 
And that was a wild experience. But yet, if I would have used that, I'm glad, I'm grateful I didn't have to in that moment. But if I would have used that, I would have wound up in jail with the policies or laws in LA. Yeah. So that's a trippy thing. But then what came to mind is like, on top of that, I'm living in a new town. It's very small because you were talking about the breaking down even the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I'm in a very, very small old fishing town, living in a log home with other log homes next to me. And I've had to actually adjust getting back to what it was maybe like before this, or maybe what it was like when I was a kid growing up in the neighborhoods I grew up in, because it was right. very free and the kids on the block and the different families. And we all just kind of bopped around one house to the next. But dude, it's been ingrained living in the city to protect my property at all costs. And so I've had to get used to my neighbors looking in my yard, me looking in their yard, waking up in the morning as the sun rises. Hi, Diane, how you doing? Good morning. Yeah, I guess yeah. she's sitting out there reading a book yeah. and I just got done meditating and I'm going to go into work. And dude, the weirdest thing is like, as I've been, I have a new job and I'm working and stuff. If I hear a knock on the door, cause we used to have like a gate around our property. So no one could ever come in during the day unless they boosted over the fence. And dude, I'm like, holy, sh-. when I hear a knock, I'm like, what? Yeah. and now I'm like, yeah. where's my gun? This is crazy, yeah. bro. This is how program, where's my gun? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first thought. And what's funny is I went the other day to answer the door after I had that reaction. I opened the door and it's Diane. She's like 80 years old, bro. And yeah. she was bringing us some tomatoes from the garden, <laughs> yeah. returning our Tupperware that we gave yeah. her when we gave her food. And there yeah. we just went a little layer deeper. We've already, since we've lived here, gotten to know one another and been exchanging food. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's like, I'm having yeah. to get used to like people knocking on the door. A buddy of mine, he works in the um, mountain rescue. He flies helicopters and he's been helping me out with some mechanical things because I've kind of been mechanically dumbed down, not having to like do a lot of stuff because money and convenience, right? So he's cool, man. He's really helpful. But even in the beginning, as we were getting to know each other, he would like come over, knock on the door. And again, that was, I was already like in fight or flight and, yeah. you know, yeah. fight mode. And I'm like, right. oh, dude, it's just, it's just Spencer. Hey, what's up, dude? Yeah. But then yeah. he would like just automatically walk inside and just be like, hey, dude, what's up? Let's go. Let's go check this out and like take his boots off. And I'm like, whoa, dude, like we just yeah. went very fast. Yeah. But him living in a very small community for so Everybody many years, yeah. it's just normal. Like, yeah. You don't even have to really like knock. Like if you the say it's such a text- natural place, it's like all these people with no shared fate, no relationship to each other. It's weird that you have a person, like when you think about a, a building, like an apartment building, mm-hmm. the idea that the person, there's a person 10 feet above your head, less <laughs> right there that you don't know yeah. or have any relationship to. And there's one here and there's one here and there's one below me too. I think sometimes like when I look at a city building, this is, pretty gross to say but i think about how much feces is moving through the walls in the pipes Mm. because all those people are shitting and flushing the toilet and you're there and some dude's feces is like moving past your head because you're leaned up against the wall it's like you don't even know the person like it's so strange that that's never happened so so yeah that idea that people and let's let's be real and and i think that people underplay how serious of an issue two legged predators can be yep that's a real thing. Yep. The, unfortunately, the gun control debate and all that stuff doesn't really, they never really pay any. Like one thing you'll never hear from the media is the number of attacks that are stopped by a person with a firearm every year. They'll never tell you that. Yep. Yep. They'll give you these huge crime statistics or gun, gun death statistics, which are mostly suicides and police shooting bad guys with guns. I mean, it's mostly what those st- statistics actually are. And they'll mm-hmm. be like, look how many people die from guns every year. And it's like, can we get an honest, genuine conversation going here because like what you just described happened to you that stuff's real there are people out there and this is goes back all the way so lest i painted two rose colored glasses kind of of a perspective of the ancient world there's always been people who want your your body your property or your life like that's the thing that's existed for a really long time but if you look back as another biological norm is you would when in history would you have ever found a dude who didn't have a weapon Mm -hmm. a bow a knife an atlatl like both it's it is actually a biologically normal thing for uh especially for men Mm -hmm. to carry a weapon 
yep. because we hunted and we had to defend our families and our tribes and our groups from other tribes. There was always intertribal warfare. It's actually very normal. What's not normal is thinking that you don't need that or yeah. thinking that there's something stupid or dangerous or backwards or deplorable about that. That's actually, again, not a biological norm. I love the idea of a world where we don't need that stuff anymore. I love that idea. Yeah, But that that's not great. this place, man. Mm -mm. So, you know, I don't mm. think there's anything weird about that. But I do think that what you're describing of coming down from the adrenaline of the city, of the fight yeah. or flight of a city, that takes some time. Yeah. And, you know, adjusting, my wife moved here from Montreal, Canada, and, um, you know, I think at first it was probably pretty hard. You know, you don't just step outside here and get a croissant and a coffee. Like you don't mm -hmm. just go outside and, and there's people everywhere walking around doing stuff, art projects and shows mm -hmm. and all, you know, but now she's like, wow, I can, I could never step outside naked into the sunlight. I could never go outside and shout to the stars or mm -hmm. burn a huge fire or like the things that we have the freedom to do here. So over time, those things have become so meaningful to her that I see now when she goes into the city environment, she's like, wow, thank God for how mm -hmm. we live. Mm -hmm. But it's hard at first, you know, mm -hmm. to, to downshift into that life. But man, is it ever worth it? Dude, it's been the one of the best decisions I've ever made and we've ever made together. Um, and I didn't realize what a difference it is just like the depth that I've been, you know, changed by living in that right. type of environment. And now because I'm here, I get to start seeing it. Um, and the goal is to get to that place where we can be even more free. Like we're still in a small town just based yeah. on, you know, what was available and pricing the whole, you know, finding a new home and everything. Life's but, short. You can only do so many things and you can only learn so many things and you, mm -hmm you have to continue to contribute and that's mm -hmm. going to eat up a lot of time and be easy on yourself because this is like, we're moving into a less free period of history mm -hmm. and you just got to have be, you got to have that self-compassion because, mm -hmm. you know, you can't learn it all. No one can do it all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, freedom is a very complex and big thing. Yeah, dude, it is. It is very, very complex and it is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we should probably wrap up here because we went way over what we kind of discussed, <laughs> but it was very fun um, diving into what we were able to talk about today. I'd love to do this again and explore other things. I find the yeah, way yeah. you think just so fascinating and um, enlightening. And that's it's great on a podcast. It's probably hard to live with. What's that? <laughs> I said it comes across good in a podcast. It might be hard to live with. <laughs> so big thanks to my wonderful <laughs> wife. <laughs> she puts up with a lot of my uh, mentition. Yeah, man. <laughs> Maybe on a podcast. That's great. Um, so I, I really do appreciate your time um, and sharing all your experience uh, with us here today. It's not over, man. I really, I really want to explore other subjects. I don't have a ton of people in my life. And it's interesting that you're talking about these as being human norms, but yet there's like so many people that I could like talk to, but yet we never talk about these things, mm -hmm. right? It's such a trip to me. Yeah. So yeah, man, we, we've, we've gone deep today and uh, just thank you so much. Yeah. I want to just say thanks to everybody listening to, because uh, listening to a long conversation between two people that goes into all these kind of challenging territory it takes a lot and so i appreciate people who stuck it out and have listened through this where can people find you where, where can they reach out to you i'm pretty active on instagram uh, at daniel vitalis and i and uh my uh show has a account as well at wild.fed mm -hmm. um that stuff's all easy to find if you know danielvitalis.com wild-fed.com um and then i have a tv show on outdoor channel which um i know a lot of people don't have cable now so we always send people to a, a streaming app called friendly f-r-n-d-l-y it's like the word friendly without vowels mm -hmm. and uh, they stream outdoor channel so you can see our tv show it's all about hunting fishing foraging food reconnecting with the landscape and then my podcast wild fed which you know is a sort of a nature-based show but we do get into some kind of interesting topics from time to time, you know, that kind of touch around the things we're talking about. So yeah, yeah I really appreciate anybody's support. Um, but more than anything, I just want to say thanks for sharing your platform today. And, and like I said, in the beginning of the show, man, I'm really happy for you. Just Thank really you. like the direction you decided to take things. And I, it could have been easy for you to um, just stay mm -hmm. doing what you were doing. You know, it's, I know how hard it is when you have a thing already built, to go like, man, I feel a calling. I'm going to walk away from it. Like a lot of people will tell you, dude, that's stupid. Just stick it out. 
Yeah. Uh, but I really respect the move you made. So congratulations. I couldn't. And I would just add to that. You've been a part of it. And cool. I think the last phone call that we had, I was walking around in Story Fitness and I was on the cusp of letting it go. And one of the main things we discussed was moving out of the city and reintegrating, you know, back into the landscape that we live on planet Earth. And um, yeah. thanks for being, um, as I put it, when I when I talk to people that I uh, look up to, it's like it, 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 in my mind, it's a light, it's a beacon. And it, it helps add to my aim and it gives me something to aim towards yeah. through that, you know, shared experience or telling of the stories and all of the things we've kind of touched on here today. So you've yeah. been a big part of that, man. And um, I've watched you maneuver over the years and I want to get into on the next time we talk that kind of that evolution, your personal evolution, you yeah. know, into this world as far as creating surthrival.com, the rewild yourself podcast and then starting a new company and a new brand and then creating the TV show through Wild Fed and your message behind that. It's just, it's incredible. The, um, the amount of effort and dedication and creativity is just phenomenal. It blows me away when I think about what you've done. Yeah. And on top of that, I'll just add, I do have a tincture of um, the pine pollen arriving today oh, on the yeah. 13th, oh, which good, is kind dude. of amazing. I looked at it this morning. I was like, oh shit, it's coming in today. Uh, so, I own the company, but I often run out of my own products. You know, I always feel bad like ordering my own products and taking them out of inventory. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that pine pollen, uh, you know, take it when you wake up in the morning, um, take it before you go to bed or take it at noon. That's mm -hmm. the time of day when, when you want to push your T levels up. Okay. Uh, but thanks for mentioning that. I didn't mention surthrival.com. That's mm -hmm. S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-A-L.com. That's my supplement company mm -hmm. and uh, the longest running. That's 13 years we've been a successful company, man. I'm so amazing. Blessed. I feel so blessed. Um, but, uh, anyway, I love those yeah. products, man. So thanks for that support. Dude, some of the most, um, incredible supplements folks. So if you're listening to this, definitely check out surthrival.com, um, talk about quality products. And that was actually some of the questions I wanted to ask you, like, how do you pick these products and where do you yeah. source them? Cause they're, they're just such a incredible, there's, it's just a whole nother level in terms of supplementation. Thank you. you. Know. Yeah. I mean, I take, you know, I think from people who've listened today, they get a sense like I, I do like to scratch beneath the surface a little bit and I go mm -hmm. a layer deeper. And mm -hmm. I do that with the products that I produce. I mean, I, I can't live out of integrity, you know, I just, it hurts. Like, so mm -hmm. I've produced products that I'm really proud of. And I'd say that where some companies have produced lots of products and are constantly rolling out new stuff, mm -hmm. man, I focused more on a limited quality of quantity of very high quality products. And so that's, my mentality and so but i'd love to come back and talk about uh, entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. business in this realm because it's a complicated thing to navigate a a kind of a slightly destructive capitalistic model mm -hmm. in a way that i think has high integrity and being able to criticize parts of capitalism without being at all interested in any of this communism nonsense that we yep. see you know what i mean like yep. I'm, I'm irritated by all of that but but uh anyway i'd love to come back and talk about that because uh, business is important and it's a way i gotta say that my staff is the besides my immediate family my staff is the closest thing to a tribe i experience because we have a shared fate mm -hmm. a shared project we might not be related but if the company goes down, we all go down with it. And so mm -hmm. there's something beautiful about having a business. If you treat your staff good, if yeah. you're not like a psycho and you treat your staff good, it's a tribe and that's powerful. We feel like we are doing something together in the world. And man, I really value these people that I work with. So mm -hmm. and it's another story. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another story I want to capture and share. So we'll do it again, man. Thanks so much for coming in right. today. You know, we, we, we kind of danced around for a little while. I, I think you got a lot going on. Um, filming another season of Wild we Fed are, yeah, right now. We're filming right. it right now. We're deep in it. And yeah, 10 episodes we'll have uh, airing starting, I think, in January. Hopefully. Okay. So folks, check out Wild Fed, the TV show as well. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Yeah anytime that's it folks thanks again for tuning in if you enjoyed the show please leave a review hit the old like button subscribe to the show and share the show with everyone you know if you'd like to go on the vision hunters journey together you can find me on instagram at the vision hunters podcast and also at cody allen story c-o-d-y-a-l-a-n-s-t-o-r-e 
why. Once again, welcome to the Vision Hunters podcast. Peace out.